have a huge group and I'd love to know it, um, what you guys know about the SAMR model, how familiar you, familiar you are with it, because it'll help me to kind of gauge how much I explain. Is this new for everyone or do you know you've heard about it? Um, what would you like to gain out of today's presentation? I've heard about it and, and I'm pretty familiar, but I like any new tips or ideas. Great, great. Anyone else like to share? I've actually never really heard about it. Okay, good. Okay, so we have a, a, almost nothing to just a little bit. Great, well, I'm glad you guys are joining us today. Um, have you heard about the TPAC model? I don't know, that's a little bit more popular, but it's much more confusing to try to, to make sense of. And so most uh, schools and, and educators I talk to prefer the SAMR model. Um, what this is, is we all have the expectation as educators to integrate technology. And we have things thrown at us like uh, the New York Digital Literacy Standards, um, the ISTE, you know, technology standards, and um, 21st century learning standards. And so every at every angle, we have an expectation to integrate and use technology efficiently in our classes and in our teaching. So I think everyone can probably agree on that. Erin, could you mute? I think we're getting some of... Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's not coming from me. So I'm not oh, sure not? that's coming okay. from All no. right. I was hearing a little bit of background noise. Okay. All right. So the SAMR model was um, created by Dr. Penditura. And it's kind of interesting. He delivered it first at a conference. And so, I mean, his original work, if you search on the internet for it, it's like a, a presentation and not an article. So, but since then, um, hundreds and hundreds of people have, you know, used it in their research, have cited it. Um, there's multiple websites on this, um, Edutopia and other places have provided lots of different um, articles, ideas uh, for how to integrate SAMR. Basically, what it is, it stands is an acronym um, that stands for substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. So when we talk about integrating technology effectively in our classrooms, how do we measure that, right? So what a teacher can say, oh, well, yes, I use technology because I have my students on Chromebooks every day. That does not indicate at all that they're using it well, that they're using it creatively, um, that the students are using it to create projects and um, to really do a deep dive into learning topics. Uh, so this is a way that educators, we can look at our lessons, look at our objectives and choose technology and choose um, ideas for using technology that really will spark students' imagination um, and really develop those technology skills. So the first, um, the first, um, I just want to show this little video. It's a four-minute video, and it just gives a really great background to um, to the SAMR model. And hopefully, the sound comes through. And if not, just let me know, and we'll try to figure that out. Every day, teachers are designing activities to target higher order thinking skills in order to engage students in rich learning experiences. But integrating technology adds a whole new layer to teaching and learning. How can technology transform your learning design? Dr. Ruben Puentadura developed the SAMR model as a way for teachers to evaluate how they are incorporating technology into their instructional practice. You can use SAMR to reflect upon how you are integrating technology into your classroom. Is it an act of substitution, augmentation, modification, or redefinition? Dr. Puentadura likens his model to moving up a ladder. The model includes a dotted line that represents the threshold where you shift from using technology to enhance learning to using it to transform learning. Transforming learning promotes higher order thinking skills, such as analyzing, evaluating, and creating, which are essential to Common Core State Standards and 21st century learning. So how can you teach above the line? Let's take a look at an example of a classroom task and how it evolves through the lens of SAMR. In substitution, technology acts as a direct tool substitute with no real functional change to the task. For example, 
Take creative writing. What if you had students write a story using a word processing program? In this case, students are substituting a handwritten story for a typed story. The task is the same with no real change in student engagement. In augmentation, technology still substitutes, but with some functional improvement. What if you took the same creative writing assignment and had students use a word processing program? They could use features such as spell check and tools for formatting. Again, the story writing task is the same, but the technology augments it with enhanced productivity. In modification, technology should allow for significant task redesign. Take the same creative writing assignment and have students use Google Docs to write their stories. Students can then share these stories with peers and provide real-time feedback. Here, technology has significantly modified the original task by introducing the benefits of student collaboration. At the top stage, redefinition, technology allows for the creation of entirely new tasks that were previously inconceivable. What if students transform their written stories into multimedia productions? After creating storyboards, students film scenes, edit clips, and add music. They can publish the videos and receive feedback from voices across the globe. In this case, technology redefines the story writing task to include media creation, critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. So, how can you use SAMR to reflect upon transforming your learning design? Quintadora offers reflection questions to help you move up the SAMR ladder and shift how you are designing learning experiences. For instance, ask yourself, what will I gain by replacing the older technology with the new technology? Have I added an improvement to the task process that could not be accomplished with the older technology at a fundamental level? Does this modification fundamentally depend upon the new technology? How is the new task uniquely made possible by the new technology? These are just a few of the questions you can ask yourself as you evaluate the design of a classroom task and consider that not all technology integration is created equal. Ultimately, SAMR can help you evaluate your use of technology and design tasks that target higher order thinking skills, engage students in rich learning experiences, and impact student achievement. All right. Okay, so hopefully that provided a pretty good little background on the SAMR model. Um, as teachers, I'm hoping that this is sounding a lot like Bloom's taxonomy. Does that, does, okay, those that have their camera on, I see the head nodding and I love that. So um, when we're designing our assignments, um, hopefully we're, we're using Bloom's taxonomy and we're trying to push students and scaffold their learning and really get them to um, be to that creative level where they're making and uh, designing um, um, designing new things, um, ha cultivating new ideas and creating new items. So that is based, uh, oops. Um, so that is very similar to the SAMR model. Like I was saying, just because we're using a Chromebook every day doesn't necessarily mean we're using it well, we're using it effectively, or we're we're pushing and helping to develop students' digital literacy skills. Um, this graphic here, when you Google SAMR, you're going to see this everywhere. Whoops, let me go back. Um, and again, for me, this looks a lot like Bloom's taxonomy, and we see like the triangles in Bloom's taxonomy, a lot of those graphics substitution, augmentation, modification, and redefinition. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because the video did a really nice job, I thought, of explaining this. But um, this really lends itself also to project-based teaching and problem-based teaching. Um, is that something that many of you here utilize? I use it in all of my classes, project-based teaching. Nobody's going to talk today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I try to use it. Uh, it's it's uh, in the primary. Uh, so I teach second grade. So it looks a little bit different. There's a lot more um, direction giving and then the project. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, we have to model it. I mean, that's that's the thing. And I think at any age or, or at any level of education, that modeling is really important, providing directions. Um, but so, and I... And I think project-based learning and project assessments are going to even be 
um, become more popular now with AI. So that way there is a guarantee that every student's um, final project is an original thing. <laughs> so um, I, I see a lot of great applications with the SAMR model. So let's, we're gonna just pick it apart and go one by one for a few minutes here. So the first level, the, so let me go back here. So the first, um, these first two levels are enhancement and then, I'm sorry. And then the last two are the transformation level. Um, there's another technology model called the T3 model that I really like as well because it it looks at TPAC and SAMR and it critiques it for pros and cons. And it has three levels, very similar to SAMR, but um, sometimes it's easier to remember fewer steps than more steps, right? <laughs> so essentially we're trying to really use technology to create and to promote student learning and problem solving and critical thinking. So the substitution, um, you know, is the most basic way of using technology. Uh, we can use our cell phones and we have an app on our cell phones. Like I have recipe apps, you know, maybe some of you have recipe apps. And so I'm opening my cell phone recipe app and using that in place of the recipe books on the shelf, right? Does you see that it's just providing that information? I'm not using that app to create anything. I'm not making anything with it, but it's just substituting how I'm accessing the information. So they can use it, for example, replacing, you know, typing instead of writing with pen, pencil and paper, or they're just using it. We have digital books now. Um, maybe some of you have subscriptions to Epic. I, I love Epic. So we have digital libraries instead of um, physical books. So there's lots of ways that technology is substituting for the physical item. And that's, that's there are still good ways of using technology. Um, they're effective, but um, it's just one way. Analogy I like to think of is our kitchen, right? And um, you've been working all day. Maybe it's parent-teacher conferences. It's been a really, you know, a long day. You're tired. And on those nights, you come home and you just pull something out and you microwave it, right? You're, you're not going to cook, right? <laughs> um, and so we're using it at our kitchen at very basic levels, right? Um, and then there's times where... Um, maybe we're we're going to augment and maybe, you know, we have the mac and cheese and we're going to put peas in it, right? Still very basic. We're not putting a lot of work into it. And maybe we're just changing a little bit to it. The modification, well, okay, you know, I'm grabbing a recipe. I'm pulling out the ingredients. Um, I'm going to follow the book. I'm going to, you know, maybe modify it by adding more servings or maybe changing some of the ingredients out because of allergies in the house or preferences, you know, something like that. And then redefinition would be coming up with your own version of the recipe um, or creating your own recipes for different things. So so just because everybody has a kitchen, right? We're not all using the kitchen the same way. And sometimes during the week, we don't use it in the same format. And so hopefully that kind of is a better analogy to understanding, yes, we have technology, but how are we using it? Um, Augmentation. So augmentation is still under the enhancement category, and we're just adding a little bit extra to that lesson. So maybe you delivered your lesson, and now you're going to augment it with a YouTube video, okay? Um, and so that YouTube video, it helps to visualize what you're talking about, um, and, and they can hear it, they can see it, they can, you know, uh, and it's a it's helping, you know, with that instruction and really reinforcing it. Other ideas, and again, these are not meant to be super amazing because it's just enhancing what we're doing, right? We're adding peas to the mac and cheese. So we're giving a PowerPoint instead of uh, maybe having posters or other types of vi visuals, you know, um, like hard copies and whatnot. Uh, I love using manipulatives and lessons, but Sometimes you have lessons that you can't use them in. And so using multimedia is more effective. Using computers for research. So we can take them to the library, which please do. It, that's a really important skill to develop in students is learning to use libraries. Um, but when they're an adult, we have universities now that are completely online, 100% online. And I know you, you know, you know, I'm telling the truth. And their libraries are all online libraries. 
Um, we have a university here in New York, Excelsior University. It's all online and students have are expected to use the library, um, but they have to use it in a different way than we're using it maybe in public schools or in our community going to that library. And we need to build those skills. So having them conduct research online, if your school has an online platform where they can do some researches, um, you know, use those skills. Some states provide a statewide education database. I came from Utah and there's a really, it's a really robust state for educational technology and the state provides lots of access to online databases and online libraries. Um, using gamification, I'm sure, most, if not all of us, have used things like Kahoot, um, Blickit, and other gamification tools where um, we're just kind of enhancing the lesson a little bit. Maybe we're using it at the end to reinforce something, um, you know, helping to review for a test or something like that. Many times on these websites, there's a game that's already made that somebody made that, that share, was shared with us. Um, that we can just quickly use, which is great. Um, and we're using technology and um, we're enhancing the lesson and the learning experience with it, which which is fine. And I'm and I'm not trying to say that that everything has to be in the upper levels, but just to make sure that we're using it in a variety of ways. And I think that's the goal. Okay. Modification is the next one. And now we are moving to the transformation stage. Um, with modification, the technology al actually alters the actual lesson. And instead of adding to it or serving as a substitute. So an example of modification in the classroom would have be the students creating a podcast. Okay, that's original material. Um, the students are creating videos. They're using tech tools to clarify abstract concepts. So maybe um, you take them um, like to Google Earth where they can, you know, you know, see the Earth from the astronaut's perspective. Um, you're using 3D models and online simulations. So you're really modifying how and, and, and interacting more with the technology. Okay. Um, does anyone else have any, I need to, I should have asked on the other two, what other ideas of modifying teaching and learning using technology comes to mind? I am a licensed assistant and all this is Greek to me. So I'm, I'm kind of just learning. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> so um, we're at, so how, so there are also, one of my favorite tools now is called ThingLink. And um, it's not creating just a boring presentation, but they're creating learning experiences now. And so this, I think, stretches between modification and redefinition. And it's involving students more in, in using the technology to investigate, to research, to be curious. Um, and you can also use it for, you know, creating amazing multimedia products uh, there are but again it's a matter of learning how to use these tools taking the time to use them you know in your lessons so the last one we have is redefinition and this um, fits in the transformation category of SAMR by where students are participating and learning activities that would not have been possible without a mobile device okay and so it redefines the way students are learning. So some ideas are using virtual reality goggles. Um, and there are also websites that uses virtual reality. Uh, there is the metaverse now. And I know of colleagues that have um, actually taught a class in the metaverse. I know that's really like for me, that's five years down the road, but they're already doing things like that where students are avatars and they enter the virtual classroom with their headsets and access through the app and participating in class, you know, in the metaverse. We're going to see more of that. We're going to see more application of virtual reality. Uh, does anybody here use any type of virtual reality in their lessons or teaching? It's kind of hard right now because it's expensive and for a lot of virtual reality, you need to have those headsets. And so there's companies like Class VR that provides classroom sets of headsets. But again, 
I think those are for very privileged school districts that have lots of money. <laughs> so. so we had the good old Google expedition sets. And if you yeah. know how to repurpose those, because of course, Google kind of stopped supporting it. But they just sit here in your office and we'd love to get them out and oh, let used. Me, I need a Google. I can't remember what those look like. Um, I'll have to I'll have to look that up, the Google expedition. But those are when VR was just getting started and you would download apps on your phone. Is that where you're sliding the phone into the goggles? Is that what the expedition headset is? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's kind of some of the first um first uses of VR. But like I was going back to ThingLink, um, those are vir they have virtual reality experiences there too, where you can um use 360 degree graphics and um, create virtual spaces and um, create activities where uh, it's like escape room type activities or um, a choose your own adventure where you have scenarios and students have to choose A or choose B and then you go down this track or you go down that track. So there's there's programs out there and there's educational software that's really um, exciting and doing really neat stuff um, and really helping students to um, to immerse them in that learning experience. And so uh, get used to that learning experience. That's going to be, I think, um, a really big topic in the next you know, four or five years. So some other ideas are connecting students globally, um, having a project where, like it said in the video, they upload their digital story to YouTube and then there's comments. But if YouTube is something that you can't use, there's other products like VoiceThread. Um, this it requires your school to buy a subscription, but it's a way to create a multimedia um, interactive lesson where students can leave uh, written comments, they can leave voice comments, they can leave video comments, and you can share projects around the world. You can have students create web pages. Do any of you like use Google Sites or um, Weebly or Wakelet? Wakelet has a lot of really neat collaborative features to it to create websites, to share content, to have class projects. So those are some other ideas. <laughs> I'm assuming like deer in headlights, like what are, what are these things that she's saying? <laughs> but um, there's, there's lots of ways that we can really help students to design projects that they're um, collaborating with others. They're, they're creating and sharing content. They're making original content. Um, so I found this infographic and I, I think it's a lot of fun. And um, so we have, you know, traditional ways of really not using technology. Um, back when I was a kid, I remember we had film strips. Do you guys remember film strips? Is that dating me? Film strips. And it would say beep and they would like change to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. Um, we had those overhead projectors in the in every classroom had an overhead projector and they would write on the overheads. Um, they, you know, things like that, TVs, VCRs. I mean, that was the tech of the time. And um, slowly, you know, now it doesn't look anything like that. It's so cool, your classrooms and the technology you guys have access to. So here's some substitution software. Um, some of it I'm familiar with, some of it I'm not because I didn't make this um, this this infographic. But um, most, if not everyone, is using Google Apps for Education. And those are some very easy ways just to substitute and get students familiar with it. Um, you know, it, the, the struggle we have is that um, Google isn't necessarily a workplace software. Um, so like when students are getting jobs, you know, and professionally or coming to the university, it kind of transforms to like Microsoft and we're seeing a, a gap now. Um, because, I mean, as great as Google is, you know, it's not as robust as the Microsoft office. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if there's a way to like help students or help the high school students to have more exposure to some of those professional software um, that they need to use uh, in the workplace. But that is something to keep in mind because um, not a lot of businesses operate <laughs> on, the, on Google. Some do, but not a lot. Uh, Prezi, if Prezi was really popular 10 years ago, but guess what? It is still around. And um, 
you can actually do videos with Prezi where you can, um, you have like your, your own presentation, the graphics are right, right below you. So it's, you're talking and engaging with your audience. It's recording you and, and then you have graphics that support your video. So there's some really fun ways that Prezi is improving this whole presentation. Um, if you think about it, like I don't love PowerPoints. Um, I use Google slides and it's still very much like a PowerPoint. So using PowerPoint is last last decade, you guys, it's two decades ago. It is not original anymore. It's kind of become the standard where, you know, we have to teach something, we expect a visual. Um, don't feel like it has to always be a PowerPoint. If you can find digital simulations online, use that. Um, there's other resources online now that we can use to engage students visually instead of always putting just text on a nice colorful background like I'm doing here, right? <laughs> All right, augmentation. Okay, so it's still, you know, is pretty much a substitute, but um, it's it has improvements. There's tools to it. Has anybody ever had their students design comics? Like that's a really fun way to have them summarize a reading that they did. So they learned about this topic. They read a story about this, and um, and then having them use something like Powtoon to create comics there. I think Scholastic uh, used to have a comic strip creator too. And so, and the reason why is because it provides the graphics because not every student feels like they can draw or they can draw well. And so using like these comic strip creators, um, they can draw and, 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 and express themselves visually through graphics and have the help and support of some of these tools. So it actually turns out pretty nice instead of just having stick figures all the time. Um, news ELA, this is, my graduate students are always talking about News ELA. Can somebody here who uses it, would you mind unmuting and telling us um, how you use News ELA? I'm gonna challenge, I'm just gonna assume that somebody here uses it. It's been a long time since I've used it because I used it when I was back in the classroom. But um, it essentially, we'll take a news articles and then, do, well, I guess back in the day when I was using it anyway, it broke <laughs> it up into like three different reading levels. So they could all be talking about the same news story, but they could be reading at levels that spoke to them. Fantastic. Thank you. And um, I have students that talk about it all the time and they love it. And so... If you haven't visited it lately and you're looking for informational text, you want to bring in some current events, um, but it has some of those tools where it has text leveling. And so it provides, you know, I think also questions and activities that go that go along with um, the articles to reinforce um, the reading and the comprehension there. So quizzes, um, this is one that's similar to Kahoot, but it's, so it's a gamification tool. Um, I like it because um, it doesn't pressure students that they have to be super fast necessarily to get those points. And when I'm doing a Kahoot, I make more mistakes because I'm trying to submit the answer first to get all of the points instead of taking a moment and like really trying to process which is the right answer. And not all students can, you know, um, are, are quick like that. <laughs> Sometimes we need, especially if you have a really complex uh, question. So quizzes is a really nice, easy way, you know, easy gamification tool. Um, there's lots of others. And I think we have another session just on gamification. So modifications, so we have, you know, Google apps at all these different levels because you can use them all different ways. You can have students creating with them. Um, Nearpod, do we have... I, Nearpod's really, really popular. Yes. Okay. Tell us how you use Nearpod and why you, or why you like it. Uh, back a long time ago when I used to have iPads, I used it with my second graders because they held up the iPad and they were in the ocean. So yeah. um, we did that on one of the assignments. It was very fun. For it them. has the virtual reality field trips you can put in there. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and with the iPads, if you walk around, it actually moves with you, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm saying that there's ways to use virtual reality without the headsets. Um, and there's there's websites out there that provide 
like the graphics or the videos or the 360 images to create those. Um, sometimes the idea of creating them seems overwhelming. So we like the near putts is, oh, here's the dinosaur Jurassic period, you know, or we're going to walk on the moon <laughs> and it's already made. We just put it in. Um, so that's really great. So um, other ways that we can um, redesign a lesson using technology to help students to apply and analyze. Do we have any other ideas uh, or maybe you have a question on how you can modify an assignment? So say, hey, Gina, this is what I'm doing and then I need an idea you know, to maybe make enhance it or something like that. If anyone wants to ask, please do. I would love to be challenged with a question. Um, redefinition. I think Flipgrid now has a new name. Doesn't it just call, isn't it just Flip now, I think? Um, here's ThingLink. This is my new favorite educational software where you can do like 30 different things with it. Learning experience, simulations, 3D models, presentations. I mean, the you know, sky's the limit with it. Um, Storybird. I love Storybird, but it got expensive. Has anyone here used Storybird? Oh, okay. Yeah. And you didn't like it? It was, I know it's expensive. I was, I was going to say I used it, but then it got too expensive. So yeah, yeah. I got too expensive and I, I loved it because it really flipped the whole creative writing process. Um, if you talk to professional writers, they don't get ideas for stories the way classroom teachers are trying to push students to do it. They wait, typically they're like, they write the title first and they sit there and they have to think and think and think about what am I, it's my story about. That is not how writers <laughs> get ideas for their stories. And so it uses artwork and graphics. Um, and so students can look at a whole selection of beautiful artwork and make digital storybooks with them. And, and they use the pictures to inspire them about what happens next. And so you end up getting some really amazing stories with the permissions to use the graphics from the authors themselves. Um, you Do can, you know if that's 2D compliant? Um, I haven't checked that in a while because it got so expensive and they, they dropped their free account. And that's the problem with programs like mine that has no budget that I can't teach a tool without a free account because then I can't have students practice using it. So I haven't uh -huh. checked it in a while. For They used to have um, like a free account and you could make X number of projects on it before you had to pay, I think. And um, and then now it's it's got so popular. Um, yeah, but um, thing yeah, link- I'm seeing a free thing account. Thing link is 2D compliant. They they have checked all the boxes. Oh, cool! For everything, yeah. Thinglink's amazing, and I love 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 yeah, it. Yeah, I've used Thinglink for a while now. Um, the the one of the things I'm wondering about is there there could be a possibility that the teacher center could try to support some of those th kinds of things. So we'll oh. have to think that going forward. Yeah, that would be so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I I yeah, I struggle here in my program because. I mean, sometimes it changes from year to year just because they stop the free accounts and it, and it frustrates me. So um, code.org, has anybody used coding with their students? Aaron says, yes, 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 that's great. So code.org has free coding lessons um, by grade level and lots of different topics. And it's a great, and you don't have to know how to code. You just put your students on there, have them open up their laptops or their computers, and they can choose a couple activities and practice coding. Um, coding can be can be supported um, in any content area because you're learning, teaching them how to problem solve, how to critically think, um, and and how to how code works. Um, and you're also helping to promote STEM careers, which is really really important, and software design. Um, students can, once they start learning how to code, then they can augment that um, using um, Thingiverse, I think is what it is. And then they can use code and they can design 3D models that you can download and print on your 3D printers. So, um, and you can even use thing. I think it's called Thingiverse. Does that sound right, Aaron? I that, that's so funny because I I've known every, almost every one of them that you've come up with, but I don't know that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's called Thingiverse. Um, 
but there's also free files on there that you can have your students manipulate um, and then download them and print them on 3D printers. So whatever you're teaching, I mean, language arts teachers are having students design um, objects for like, that would be a scene in one of, in the story or, or, or a place that they're learning about and create in, like entire um um, like landscapes and, and different things. Um, they're they're creating new ideas and they're coming up with inventions and new ways to design things. And so there's platforms that are free that you can design these 3D models on that will be print that can be printed on 3D printers. So, and we have a 3D printer here that you guys could use. And yeah, like, yeah. That, that that was the whole intention was people who would come and just play with the thing because usually you have a 3D printer in a school and it's connected to a program or it's a shop class and you're going to screw it up here. It's just to play with. Well, and the great thing is, is that you don't have to know how to use it because people there do. And so you don't have to have that stress of like, well, I can't I can't use anything that has to do with 3D printers or have my students, you know, design do anything with that because I don't know how to use it. But we have resources here where, where you download the file just on a flash drive and you can bring it in and he'll upload it and put it in and then probably takes a day and then, <laughs> and then you get to come pick them up. Yeah, they're they're not fast. Um, so um, Edpuzzle, um, Edpuzzle, I, I love it. It's I like it ish. Um, and I, I think it's doing better now than what it was five years ago where you're taking your a video and then you're adding questions to it. So you can, it stops and it has students answer questions. Um, it was really clunky a few years ago to try to get it to like work and to figure out how to insert the questions and how to share it. Um, but I think it's doing a lot better now. I, I would more, I would probably put that more on the modification and not maybe so much on the evaluation and creating. Um, but one thing I would add here if, is, and I, we're gonna be talking about this in another um, in another class is Canva. Is every, does everyone here use Canva? Yes? Yeah, and so Canva comes out every year with um, new products and you can have um, a lot of free access to a lot of their best stuff with your educator's email address. And they have interactive whiteboards and presentations, videos. You can create um, folders and have students have classwork. So you can have them turning things in and have like all of your student projects in one place. Um, they have a lot of templates for, you know, lesson plans, schedules, making infographics. So you, you can make infographics. You can assign your students to make infographics. If you don't know what infographics are, please unmute and ask me and I'm happy to show you. Um, but having them create digital products using Canva is wonderful because instead of having to find 10 different websites to do 10 different things, Canva is really brilliant that you can do all of those things in one place under one account. And there's lots of ways to share it and to download it and interact with it. Um, Let's see other, what else, what else, what else? Okay, so what questions do you have about SAMR? This is your time to ask questions and I'll try to help you and find a tool that I know of that will help, to, you know, help to, you know, help to integrate with that. What ideas or questions do you have? I don't have a question, but I um, see Seesaw on your list. And uh, mm -hmm. I used that a lot in second grade uh, during COVID when we had remote learning. Um, and it was a great way to have the students read a section, record it. And then I watched it and gave suggestions back or they wrote stories or it was a wonderful interactive tool. Yeah, Seesaw's, I, I, younger or elementary teachers, I've heard a lot of, of just, they love Seesaw. For elementary. Mm -hmm. A lot of fun things you can do. Other questions? How do you get started with SAMR? Um, you know, if you if you have Chromebooks in your classroom or laptops, there's a lot you can do on the free tools, but um, I'd love it if you guys had a question or you can challenge me with something. <laughs>
Should I check the chat? I'm not sure. Yeah, I don't think there's anything in the chat. Oh, okay. Other yes. than what Aaron is posting that I can see. No, um, I didn't even know what Sambra model even was. So, so I, I, the, I'm learning. <laughs> the Sambra model, um, yeah, the, the thing is, is that a problem we had with um, this really fast one-to-one -one adoption with technology after COVID is that um, schools now felt like, you know, I, they're pretty much required to have one-to-one -one technology and teachers were not prepared at all about, you know, how am I using this laptop or this uh -huh. in my classroom every day? And so they're just using it at basic, basic levels instead of actually trying to be more creative and pushing students to create new things and make new things and problem solve and do projects with them. So you, you definitely can do the hands-on projects and building, you know, dioramas and, you know, doing science fairs and things like that, which are great. And, and I'm not saying not to do that, um, but there's other, but we also have an obligation to help students to learn how to use technology for more than just typing and making a Google slide presentation. Um, that is basic. It's not super impressive anymore. Um, and, you know, if you're using Google Docs or the Google apps and you're not using those collaborative tools, then you're missing out a lot. Um, mm -hmm. Google now has its own AI that you can sign up for. It's not, it's not automatically there. I'll, I've signed up for it and I, I'll show you. Um, We'll just go to docs real fast and we'll just start a new doc. And I think I might've shown this last time. Oh, here we go. Okay. So my AI assistant is going to pop up. So AI now um, that can be used. It's not substitution, but it's, it's going to be higher up, but we're using it for brainstorming. We're using it to help us create new things. So it's it's another it's another um, innovative way to integrate. But see, this is some of the AI tools, and it's going to prompt you. And this is an AI help me write. And up here in my corner is my uh, Ask Duet AI, mm -hmm. and so that's the AI assistant on here. So I can say help me write. Um, let's see. Um, help me. Right. Uh, lesson about, I don't know, let's talk about, um, um, it's now um, February, so we'll say Martin Luther King Jr. for eighth grade student. And the purpose of adding AI, um, and I know this isn't specifically about AI, but AI uh -huh. definitely it's into the SAMR model, it's, it's to help with productivity and it's to help with producing better quality work, um, not to plagiarize. So this would be something that I'm using because all oh, I need ideas of how I can teach this better. I'm not going to upload this to teachers, pay teachers and expect somebody to pay me for it. Okay. That's very different or uh, publish it in, in a magazine or, or online or something. So, um, this is their AI writing assistant. And, you know, if you like it, you can refine it. You can make it more specific, um, give feedback. If you like what it has, you can insert it into your document. And there's, you know, there's the lesson. And of course I would read through it, but like that took, I don't know, five, 10 seconds to write a lesson. And sometimes that's really helpful because as teachers, we're in a pinch, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you can have students use that for, you know, helping them to brainstorm ideas for a story or for a project. Um, and, and it might be a little bit safer because we don't want them necessarily going on to chat GPT for everything. We don't want to create those habits, but we want to show how AI can assist them. So on the SAMR model, um, you know, it's helping to modify, it's, it's augmenting their writing, but the redefinition, um, that's where we want to see students making products where they're using technology um, and making new things, whether it's a website, a, a podcast, a, a video, 
Um, they're sharing things globally um, and they're really using it to, to evaluate and to be creative, just like in that Bloom's taxonomy model. So um, school districts that understand the SAMR model, when they go in to evaluate teachers, um, many times they'll be looking and, and they'll, they know this and they'll be looking to see how they're using the technology. Um, you know, are they using it creatively or help modifying the lesson or augmenting it? And I think most of us can pretty much, you know, find a YouTuber or tick tick or a TED talk or something to modify and augment, sorry, to augment a lesson. Um, but it's but we also we want to get to where we're modifying, we're doing virtual reality, we're going beyond just the textbook and the pencil and the paper. And we're using technology to explore, to promote curiosity and creativity um, and to prepare tomorrow's leaders and, and, and scientists and, you know, computer designers and every field um, to using technology to benefit society and to solve the problems that we all have. So that is all I have. Um, if there's, are there any other questions that anyone might have? Yeah, so I was kind of curious how you guys are all navigating that 2D law. Because when I was in the classroom, I just loved coming up with the finding new things. Like, so I, I did try most of those things. But then the 2D law came through and found that I couldn't do a lot. So are you guys navigating that? Or are you just kind of sticking with what the school gives you? How are you guys handling that? I think our teachers have just been sticking with what the school offers. They have a list of tools that are approved to use kind of a thing. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, some schools are, yeah, they're, they're really uh, conscious about this and they don't want teachers just experimenting with anything that has to be approved or something like that. There's an approval process, which can be a little frustrating and kind of squelches creativity sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And I know some people like used to kind of have the kids make up their own and kind of make up accounts and things so that they wouldn't track their data. But that I guess that's kind of sort of questionable ethically. <laughs> Where would social media fall in SAMR? And again, it depends on how you're using social media. There's TikTok, there's um Oh, right. You know, Facebook, there's um, Pinterest. So we have, you know, like uh, project boards that are collaborative, they're social, they're, you know, uh, so there's, there's lots of different types of social media. So if I were to put together a Pinterest board, for example, um, how would that work in SAMR model? Understand, apply? I think so. Yeah, because you're not creating anything new, but you're organizing and you're showing, you know, understanding and you're applying technology and you're trying to, you know, find commonalities and things like that. So that's what we have in our, our Pinterest boards, like your crafts and hobbies and maybe academic things and whatnot, career focused. Um, and a student in one of my classes today was talking about uh, she's a fax teacher and uh, having her students like create TikToks of, of different recipes and cooking. Uh, yeah. yeah, and then sharing that on TikTok or something. Yeah. And so we're using um, TikTok in a productive educational way and and not, you know, not for some of the other things that we don't like about it, but, um, you know, those are all good. And, and we need to show and model correct uses of social media because as adults, there's platforms like LinkedIn um, and others where, um, you know, where you're you're trying to post, you're trying to kind of keep known, you're trying to market yourself, um, you're trying to network with others. And so we have to figure out how to develop those skills, um, you know, ethically, safely, um, and, and model good practices. But let's see. Um, I know it's some people to do like surveys for re research on Facebook. So they'll use that. There's there's problems with that now. The problem is that there's a lot of um, companies that are paying people to complete surveys or <laughs> surveys on Facebook, like where they offer um, like a $5 Amazon gift card. And 
they'll have like every member of their family fill out the survey. And so the data is worthless. Uh, and so I well, have, I have some graduate students that are, that have talked about this and I've had some colleagues that are really, they've written articles about this. And so, it, so people are filling these out unethically because they're not whatever that population they're trying to look for other teachers or something like that. So I guess it depends on how big you get, because I know the ones that I've seen are, was just like a Google doc, link to a Google doc and saying my son or daughter is working on a yeah, project yeah. to fill this out. Yeah, I know. I, I think it depends on which Facebook groups you're posting it in. Like, yeah, you know, right. And if <laughs> so, but that that's it's another it, that's another concern with and that's again another topic of of how we're ethically using technology um, and you know, falsifying data for somebody just to get a $5 Amazon card. Like, you know, that, that's not what we, that's not how we want to use social media. And it's frustrating for those that are trying to solve problems and get data and do better. Yeah. I guess it's no different than like even a pro professional developments like this. Right? Like we have some people that will just pop on and turn the camera, uh, you know, turn the camera off and walk away. Right. And get yeah. the PTLE hours and other people really dutifully pay attention and really do the work. Oh, and I appreciate because we've had two people actually participate in the conversation, which yeah. is, makes it a more interesting presentation yeah. experience. So I appreciate that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think it's funny that you've noticed that that wasn't just me. So. <laughs> oh, I, I mean, it's across the board. Myself, yeah. I do it, but yeah, no, but at least you're, you're chiming in and you're participating in the conversation. And we appreciate yeah. that. That's wonderful. So and, I, and no shade to anyone, you know, there, I, we do have people that like, like are just trying to cram stuff in. And so they all be driving yeah. and they want to take it as an extra thing. And, you know, we don't want to discourage that kind of stuff either. No, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't. Yeah. We're, we're happy for the eight people that are here today. Yeah. <laughs> so next time, um, so today's okay. It'll be February 15th, international and global classroom connect. And so that ties into redefinition. It ties into our New York State standards. It ties into um, international technology standards, ISTE standards. Uh, and then, but that's a big challenge. And how do we get started with those global connections and what kind of projects can we do? And how, you know, do we find other teachers in other classrooms, you know, across the country or globally? Um, that are interested in collaborating and doing some of these things. So I will share with you um, some of my experiences and um, provide ideas and suggestions of how to get started. If that's something that interests you, I'd invite you to come back on February 15th. Now that one, teachers... I'll be out of town, so I will not be. <laughs> lucky right you, lucky you. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. We're going to be out of town. Is that during our break? Uh-oh, did I screw that up? It's the week before our break, actually. I'm, my parents um gotcha. taking okay. them to Florida. To, for, I thought I had consciously thought about the breaks, but I was a little concerned. And then, to, <laughs> so Gina, we work with um with uh, Maria Montoya with the Coil program, mm -hmm. and so we will support all that kind of stuff. And we have a program coming up on uh, the Fulbright scholarship with her too. So all these oh, people. Yeah. Can, we can make those. Let me, let me in on that because I want to do a Fulbright this year so I can do, hopefully, if I get accepted, do a, a, the experience in summer 2025. Ooh, that's but exciting. I, I have to, I have to get, get on that project. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> any, any information or support I'd appreciate. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. It was nice to have you join us today. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, everyone. Um, take care. Right, bye -bye. Have a good week. Bye. Thanks.